Well, who hasn't wondered what life would be like if you had made some different decisions? If you've taken some different paths in your life, maybe just even one or two. Um, there's several paths in my life when I look back on them. I know that I did the right thing. I know I made the right decision, and I know that the alternative would have been bad for me, would have been worse. But then there's others where I, I wonder, like, well, what could that have led to if I made this choice or that choice? And it's easy to look back at how things did turn out, but I'll tell you what's a lot harder to do, and it's, it's hard to predict how things could have turned out, and that's what we always try to do. Well, what could have things looked like? I suppose there's Part of that is uh, the reason why we're encouraged to walk in the Spirit, right? Follow the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, is because we can wonder all day long would different choices have led to better things. But what we do know is if we're following the Spirit of God, at the minimum we can have confidence that the things we are doing and the way things are going are at least what is good for us. Amen? It, maybe it could have been better from our perspective, but we know if we're following the Lord, we know at least the plan that he has for me is best for me, no matter how it looks. There's this time in the Old Testament as the Israelites were being led by God out of captivity from Egypt, where they kind of faced this type of scenario, where there's multiple options, and God is leading them away from Pharaoh and God as you know the story has sent Moses to free his people tell Pharaoh let my people go Pharaoh is resistant and doesn't want to listen and if you know the story the ten plagues come upon the land and after Pharaoh's son dies he's finally like all right that's it get out of here I don't want any more to do with you guys and Pharaoh lets the people go this is where we're going to pick up at and this is in Exodus chapter 13, be focusing on verses 17 and 18 today. It says, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So I have a question. Usually they're rhetorical questions. Today this is a real question. Who led the people? God. Yeah, I know when you whisper it, it's because you're not real sure. But God, you guys whispered, enough people whispered God loud enough. God. God was leading the people. And there's something about God leading us that is often overlooked. Do you know God has options? Does anybody realize that? God has options. We don't usually think that because we see the way that God has led us, and we see one thing, because he led us one way, and we usually have other thoughts. But what we don't think about is that God had options when he chose to lead you the way that he did. And we're told right here with the people of Israel that there were two ways. He could have led the people. This gives us a glimpse into what God sees and maybe why he does some of the things that he does. He says there's two options, but what he does not do is he doesn't ask the people. He doesn't say... Hey, which option would you prefer? Which, you know, here's the plan. Which one? Choose A or B. Which one would you want? He doesn't tell them there's options. He doesn't even give them choices. Now, how many of you, now typically, I'm not going to do this a men and women thing because I've seen it both ways, but it's definitely a driver-passenger thing. If you're driving the car and you're trying to decide where to go, the person in the passenger seat is not going to help you. They are not going to make a decision. You tell them two places, they don't want to pick which one, but if you pick one place, they will not want to go there. <laughs> this is what it is like to be a Christian following God. 
If he gave you two choices, you wouldn't want to pick which one, but if he gives you one choice, you don't want to do that either. And so imagine what it's like from God's point of view, and he doesn't give them the choices. He says, in his infinite wisdom, God knows the beginning from the end. We know that he knows the hearts of men, so he knows what the people are dealing with inside. He knows their history and what they've just been through in captivity. He knows how good, how bad, how indifferent their faith is at this point. And God looks at the choices and he makes the choice that is best for the people and he leads them that way. Now, when I travel, I pretty much always use uh, Apple Maps. Sometimes I'll use Google Maps, but I, you know, I pull it up. I like to, especially if I'm going somewhere far, I like to look at my options and kind of figure things out and just try to plan accordingly. And what I like about that is you get to see a couple of things right up front. What's the shortest path? What's the quickest path? Those are not always the same thing, are they? Especially on a long trip. The shortest path is not always the quickest because it may have to do with traffic or, or the, the places you're going through having to slow down and, and speed back up or whatever it is. But I like to know what's quickest, what's shortest. I also like to see things like, are there delays? Are there tolls? Before I had an eye pass, it was awful. I always tried to avoid tolls because number one, if you brought a hundred dollars, tolls would have been a hundred and one. Guaranteed. If you brought 10, tolls would have been 11. It was always just more than what I had. I hated tolls. I want to know, can I avoid tolls? Now I have an eye pass. I just drive right through them. I don't care. But I would like to know these things, this information. What's the whole purpose of that app? It's to give you the information and let you decide what is best for you, right? Now, me and Austin might both be taking the trip. I might take the quickest way. He might take the shortest way, right? It's, it might be different for him than it is for me. He might have, he's flush with cash. He'll pay all the tolls, doesn't care, money left over to spare. Me, I don't have any money. I'm poor. I'm a pastor, right? And so like, I'm like, I'm going to stop on the side of the road and see if somebody will pay my tolls for me. I got to drive through. But it, it's not about you. The app doesn't know you. The app just knows information. And it says, here's the information. What do you want to do? Now, why can't it tell you what's best? Well, it's missing a piece of information. It doesn't know you. It just suggests the one that it thinks is the best, and you are not figured into the equation. What is this app doing? It's not giving you instruction until you pick one. Once you pick away, it'll give you instruction. Prior to that, it's just giving you suggestions. But I want to tell you that God is not like that. We think he is, and we treat him like he is, but God is not a God of suggestion. He's a God of instruction. He tells you what to do right from the start. He doesn't say, would you like door number one or door number two? He looks at what's behind the door, and then he looks at you, and he says, if you try to go through door number one, you're not going to make it. You, sir, need to go through door number two, right? He looks at you, and he gives us instruction. He's a God of instruction. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. So God tells you where to go. He instructs you, but he also teaches you along the way, and he guides you according to what he sees, according to his eye. We have this saying that, you know, God is not your co-pilot. And like to a degree, I sometimes I like that, but at, really at the end of the day, I, I kind of don't at the same time. I mean, the meaning of it's good. God's not just in the passenger seat along for the ride. He's the one in charge. But, but I also don't really like the idea that God's the pilot. And I'll tell you why. How often in your life has God said, I'm driving, just jump in the back and I'll let you know when we get there? It's not real often. Actually, what he usually says is, all right, going to Effingham, get behind the wheel, I'll tell you how to get there. 
right? It's, he's not pilot or co-pilot. He's just along with us for the ride. In reality, isn't he more of a teacher and a leader? Isn't he more of an instructor, kind of like you had in driver's ed when you got behind the wheel and they're like, turn left, slow down, speed up, get over, stop, get out of the car, you're never driving again because you're gonna kill everybody, right? Isn't he more like a teacher where he says, hey, this is what you should do, now let's do it. Doesn't he let us take the wheel? We like to sing Carrie Underwood, Jesus take the wheel, right? No, Jesus isn't gonna take the wheel. Jesus says, you take the wheel and go where I told you to go. And go how I told you to go. We need God's instruction and his guidance because he's going to pick a path for us to take and then he's gonna expect us to get moving. He sees what we cannot see. And church, this is both in the spiritual but also in the natural. God sees things that we do not see. And for the people of Israel, as he's leading them away from Egypt, he said there were two ways. Now, when you think about the fact there's two ways, he tells us some information about these ways. He says the first way is the short route, and the second way is the long route. Now, God, knowing all things, having all the information, chooses the long route. If God gave the people the choice, do you think the people would have chose the short route or the long route? Probably the short route. In most cases, what would you choose, the short route or the long route? Probably the short route. I mean, who wants to be in the car longer than what you have to be? Now, what if you're on the fence and I, I told you that on the short route, there will be excitement to the extreme, and on the long route, there is going to be boredom to the extreme. Which one are you taking? Short route. I mean, who wants to be bored? It's bad enough I got to jump in the, in the car and make a long drive, or you know, I'd rather at least make a short one and have some excitement. So probably everybody's saying, I'll take the short route, please. Thank you, God. What if I was to tell you that the short route would have conflict and the long route was just long. Right? The reason the short route's exciting is because there's conflict, there's trouble, there's something that's gonna happen that's gonna go on. The long route is boring just because it's long. Now how many people are still taking the short route? Landon Wood. I'm taking the long route because I don't want conflict on my travel. I've had a flat tire on the side of the interstate one time and I didn't think I was gonna survive it, and I hopefully never will again. I will always take the easy route, not necessarily the short route. But the short way for the Israelites wasn't just short. God said that if they take the short route, that something is waiting for them there, and it's war. The short way would look appealing, but at the end of the day, the battle that they would have to go through on the short route wouldn't be worth the time saved because the time would still be spent. But instead of traveling, it's going to be spent fighting. That doesn't really sound very appealing to me. What if I said you're going to blow your engine on the way on the short route, right? You'll still get there eventually, but there's going to be conflict. There's going to be trouble. You're going to be stuck. You're still going to spend the same amount of time at the end of the day. You would gladly take the long route just driving nice and slow down the highway, and getting there when you get there. When I think about these choices, I would gladly take God's wilderness journey over the war with the enemy. But now when we think about the enemy, what if I told you that either way, you were still going to have to deal with the enemy? It doesn't matter if you take the short route or the long route, you have to deal with the enemy either way. There's two types of enemies that we see in this potential journey. The one way they had the Philistines waiting for them, and the other way they would have Pharaoh pursuing them. Now, which way would you want? Do you want the enemy waiting for you along the path, or do you want the enemy chasing you down from behind? Now, how many of you are letting God make that decision? 
I'm saying, you know what, at the end of the day, I think I'll sit this one out. I think now I know what it's like to be that person that doesn't want to pick the place to eat because I don't really know which one at the end of the day I want because neither of them sound that good to me. I don't want the enemy waiting for me, and I don't want the enemy chasing me down. So, God, I'll let you have this one. How many of you guys would give God that one? How many of you guys know which one you want? You got a strategy. You guys got strategies already. Deuteronomy 28, verse 7 says, The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. At the end of the day, we've got to trust God on either journey, don't we? Whether it's the short journey or the long journey, whether the enemy's in front of us or the enemy's coming from behind, we've got to trust God because it is he who will defeat the enemy before our face and he'll make him flee seven ways. God did not want the people of Israel to see the war with the Philistines, and he says there's a reason why. He didn't want them to change their minds and go back to captivity. He didn't want them to see an enemy that you got to remember they've already defeated multiple times throughout history, and he didn't want them to be freed from Egypt, start down this short journey, and see that old enemy from the past standing in the middle of the road, just waiting for him. That's what the Philistines represent. They represent the enemy of the past. Something you've been through, you've got through, and who in the world would want to face that again? That was a hard enough battle, and here they are just showing up again and again and again. But if God were to leave them the other way, they still are going to have an enemy. But instead of waiting there, the enemy would be chasing them down. He saw the short route and he thought, man, if they see the enemy they've already faced, what they might think is, you know what? Turns out we were better off making bricks. I'm just going to go back to captivity. But this long route, this long route, God determines is better for the people because they're not going to change their minds. Now, if you know the story, the Israelites tried to change their mind a million times throughout their time in the wilderness. But instead, this enemy that's chasing them down, Pharaoh, he represents the devil who's in constant pursuit of God's people, right? If you believe in Jesus, if you're born again, if you're saved, you're set free, you no longer belong to the enemy, you've been freed, but does he ever really stop pursuing you? No. He, he knows he's been defeated. He knows that Jesus paid the price, and when you've accepted the, the price that Jesus paid, you're set free. And the enemy at first is like, all right, well, what am I going to do about this? Kind of like Pharaoh when his son died. He's like, all right, I give up. And you don't even get halfway down the road. And he's like, wait a minute. Turns out I want that one back. Turns out I'm not okay just giving this person over to God. I'm going to pursue them. And he constantly follows us and tries to draw us back to him or take us captive again. But, but God Leading the people away represents the Holy Spirit, who's constantly working in us and leading us away from the enemy, away from his influence, away from his control, away from captivity. And if we follow Christ and we listen to the Holy Spirit, he will instruct us. He'll teach us along the way. He'll tell us where we should go. He'll guide us with his eye away from the enemy. Now, if you're like me at different points in your life, maybe you think I've made the wrong decision. Maybe God's trying to tell me to go down this long path and, and Tim and his stubbornness decided he's going to take the short path because it's short. And I can probably get through it anyway. What if you don't listen? What if you don't go the right way? Well, what we know is the enemy might be there waiting for you, but God is with you. And you still have the power to overcome. What if you go down that wrong path? It's not going to be peaceful. Now you're going to have to fight. But God is with you, and you have the power to overcome. You still have the victory because he is with you. But I'll tell you what, it's going to be a tougher path. It's going to be a difficult journey. 
What if you're one who's obedient? Anybody in here, you're always obedient to the Lord. For some of you that try to, right? I try to. Sometimes my hearing's not so good, right? If you try to follow God's plan, you overcome the enemy. You just get to enjoy the journey, right? At that point, it's like, hallelujah, I'm going down God's path. We overcame the enemy. Now I get to enjoy the journey. Well, that's not really how it goes. It would be nice if it worked like that, wouldn't it? But if you've followed the Lord for very long at all, you know that at some point you're going to face some obstacles on the path. And here we see two specific obstacles. Remember that short way God said there's a specific reason why he didn't want to lead the people down the short path. He said it was the Philistines were going to be there waiting, but the Philistines weren't the actual reason why God didn't want to take them down the path. The reason was the people's minds. He said, I worry that they would change their mind. They would see the Philistines and they would change their mind. But on the long way, we know that there's also an obstacle because we know the rest of the story. At some point, they're going to come up against the Red Sea, a physical barrier with no place to go. And so what that shows us is that whichever path God leads us, we shouldn't be surprised that there's also obstacles on the path. See, it's easy to get stuck in the, I'm following God, he's overcome the enemy, things are going to be easy. This path is going to be smooth, and then when it's not, we start to get upset with God or irritated with God or question God like, well, you're the one that led me down this path. Why are there all these obstacles? The thing is, we face the obstacles no matter which path we take. But at the end of the day, the only obstacles that really remain, if we've already won the spiritual battle, we're just stuck with two types of obstacles our mind, and physical things. The obstacles that we face on the path often are our own minds. What do we think about what God is doing? What do we think about this path and this way and these things that we're encountering? And that's often influenced by how we feel. What do I think? What do I feel? The other obstacle could be physical, like the Red Sea. Imagine this exodus of people. Some uh, theologians believe it was 30,000 people. Others believe it was 2 million. I lean towards the 2 million. It's probably a lot, a lot of people. As they're taking off and they're leaving, imagine 2 million people getting to the edge of the Red Sea as they can hear the chariots coming behind them. Right? For a long time, that journey probably seemed like it was great. This is great. Hallelujah. We're free. We're just marching down this road. It looks great outside. We can do whatever we want now. Let's just go the way God tells us to go. And then they get to the edge of the Red Sea, and they can begin to hear the chariots pursuing them. Think about this physical barrier Two million people at the edge of the sea with no way to get across. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty terrifying to me. See, we face these same two obstacles either way. Whichever way God leads us, we're either going to face an obstacle of our mind or a physical obstacle, and we tend to blame God or question His ways. But keep in mind that God knew the other options. God knew the alternatives, and we do not. We might think we do. Well, this God could have done this because we could have done this. No, you don't know what the actual options were when God said, come this way, follow me. And here we are doing what he said. We find ourselves where we've overcome the enemy again, And now we're dealing with mental and physical junk. And as a believer and a follower of Christ, we often think, man, I can't catch a break. Shouldn't this be easier than what it is? I don't know about that. I don't know if it should have been easier. I don't know if it could have been easier. It's possible. What I know is that if that's the way you feel, then it's not. 
Okay, so there's no reason to fret about that, that it could have been easier. What I do know for sure is that it could have been harder, right? It could have been harder because you could have went on your own, on your own path and not had his presence. And that path is going to be more difficult. Amen? Amen. Your path could be worse. It could be harder. What I know is that Jesus died on a cross and rose from a grave so I could be saved, freed, and forgiven from the enemy's control, no longer bound by Satan. And I know that he ascended to heaven so the Holy Spirit could come and dwell in and among us and be present in our every time of, every time of need. I know that that's true. And what I know is that he knows all things. All things. Right? We think we know all things. We know some things. And I know that whatever path he is leading me down has got to be the right path for me. I don't have to choose which way. I don't have to choose door number one or door number two. I just have to follow Christ and go his way. I overcome the obstacles of my mind by taking them to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. See, it's actually the spiritual power that we have in Christ that allows us to destroy the thoughts that go against Christ. It's that spiritual power that allows us to take those thoughts captive in Christ. Anybody ever told you that before? Just take your thoughts captive and you're like, man, I've been trying. <laughs> like, I just can't do it. You're trying to do something in the natural that needs to be done in the spiritual, right? You need to get alone with Jesus. You need to read his word. You need to pray. You need to be in his presence. Get your focus and your attention on him. And then the Holy Spirit will allow you to take those thoughts captive that are coming against Christ. You can overcome your thoughts and your feelings. And you can make them submit to Jesus. See, at the end of the day, our arguments must end with because God says, not but I think. Right? But that's where our hang-up is. We, as Christians, we just like to put those together. Well, God says this, but I think. Or sometimes people will tell about how miserable and terrible everything is, but God is good. And I'm like, well, you're tacking that on the end just like throw up some Hail Mary prayer and you throw in Jesus name on the end where you're like, well, that really wasn't a prayer. It was really just a complaint session, but I did it in Jesus name. So, hey man, everything's going to work out for me. Well, think about that when we're going through this battle in our mind. And at the end of the day, we don't even really try to overcome it. We just say, well, I know the word says this, but I think, but I believe, but I want, but I feel. No, we've got to take those things Captive. Those are arguments that come against the knowledge of God. Arguments that come against the knowledge of God are supposed to be torn down and they're supposed to be brought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. We overcome those things by getting spiritual with them and submitting them to Jesus. And then we overcome physical obstacles by trusting in a miracle working God. Psalm 1829. For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. How many of you guys are sticking around for the wall leaping contest after church today? We're going to find out who's got faith and who doesn't. Betty, you ready to leap over a wall? You going to leap over one? Betty's first in line. Think about this. By my God, I can leap over a wall. I don't know what physically gets in your way, but what I do know is that my God can move it just like he moved the waters and dried the ground at the Red Sea for two million people to cross through. Do you realize that is a 
history lesson. That is not a fictional story. It's not some feel-good lifetime movie like God really parted the Red Sea. He really dried the ground and two million people really went across. Amen. And then he really destroyed the enemy when he let those waters collapse over all those who were pursuing the people of God. That's a true story. I believe that God can defy physical limitations in our lives. Church, if we don't believe that, then I don't think our faith is in the God of the Bible. I don't believe it's in Jesus Christ if you don't believe that he can defy physics. He can. God isn't bound by the physics of this world. I believe that by my God, I can leap over a wall. I believe that. Now, what do you mean by that? It doesn't mean that today we can just have a wall leaping contest and see who can jump over a wall that's too high for a person to jump over. That's not what it means. What it means is I believe that God can give me the ability to overcome physical obstacles that are in the path that he leads me down. I believe he can give me the ability to overcome any physical obstacle in the path that he leads me down. Now that might be a physical obstacle like the Red Sea. That might be a physical obstacle as in my own body or some limitation that I have, but I believe that God can help me to overcome all those limitations. It doesn't mean I can do anything that I want, but it does mean I can do anything that he wants. Church, that's a truth for you to grab a hold of today. It doesn't just mean you can do what you want. It does mean you can do what he wants for you. At the end of the day, church, we just need to make sure that we're going God's way. We need to make sure we're going his way. Listen, not to question, is this path going to be short or is this path going to be long? Stop it. All right, Tim, I'm speaking to you. Stop it. Stop trying to figure out, is this going to be long or short? Because you want to know before you take off. Trust Jesus. That's it. You don't need to know if it's long or short. Trust Jesus. Stop trying to figure out, is the enemy going to be waiting for me there? Or is he going to be pursuing me along the path? Because I want to know what I need to do to prepare. Listen, you don't need to do all that. What you need to do is trust Jesus. You don't have to get hung up on the physical and the mental obstacles that you're going to face. Sometimes we spend so much time trying to figure out how to plan for doing what God has called us to do that we miss the opportunity to do what he's actually called us to do. If he tells you to speak to somebody in the store today and you sit there and try to figure out, like, is this going to be a short conversation or a long one? Are they going to receive it or just talk about me after I leave? Or is this going to be, am I going to be able to think of the things to say? Or are they going to take a swing at me? You try to figure all that stuff out. Guess what? They've already left the store. That's how we live our lives a lot of times. Where instead of just trusting him, we try to figure everything out. And then, well, that's not trust, church. It's not trust if you try to figure it all out first. Right? You've heard if God leads you to it, he'll lead you through it. I believe that's true for us today. And so for you and me, we have one concern. There's just one thing you've got to do, and it's not pick which path. It's just knowing which path are we on. Is it on mine or am I on his? That's it. It's that simple. Would you stand with me? This morning, do you think about that? Which path am I on? Am I on God's or am I on my own? I just want you to be open to the Holy Spirit speaking to, you, speaking to you about that as we pray. Father, I just pray right now for each and every person in this place, those watching online, or that first of all, we would know, are we on God's path of salvation for our lives? Have we answered that call to follow Jesus, to be committed to him? Not just to receive him as Savior, but to follow him as Lord, as the one who's in charge, the one who is master over our lives. Lord, I pray today that you would speak to every heart and mind in this place.
that we would know if we've said yes to Jesus. If we know, would know that it's, if it's lip service or if we actually have given him our heart. I pray today would be the day of salvation for those who are unsure or uncertain. And I believe your word is true and it says the Holy Spirit is, is the down payment of the inheritance to come. That we should know for sure that we belong to Jesus. I pray that today would be the day for that. Lord, for those who are following Christ, who have given their life to you, I pray today would be the day that you would just speak to them about the details of their life, the things they're doing with the time that you've gifted them. Are they on your path? Are they working where you want them to work? Are they involved with people that you want them to be involved with? Are they serving the way you want them to serve? Or are they on the path that you have for them to use the gifts and talents that you've given them to glorify you with? God, I pray for every heart and mind in here that we would be surrendered to you, that we'd be able to hear your voice, that if we need to alter the path, that today would be the day we would alter the path. Lord, as you would say, come over here, we'd be obedient. Lord, not filled with questions, not filled with doubt, perfect trust that you'll lead us down the right path, whether short or long, that you are with us and for us, whether the enemy's in front or behind. And Lord, that in spite of our limitations, Lord, we serve a God who is able, who is willing to give us the power to overcome all the things that we think and all the things that we encounter, that we can do the work that you've created us to do. Lord, we give it all to you. We ask you to have your way with us as we enter into worship. Holy Spirit, will you speak to our hearts? And will you do what only you can do? In Jesus' name, amen.